So I've been thinking about suffering. Partly because suffering is something that happens to one. And it's a great spur, of course, to want things to change when you're in its grip. And you wonder whether it will end, whether you can escape it, whether suffering can really be eased. What's its meaning? As meaning evaporates in suffering's presence. And it always leads me to feel that maybe part of the challenge of suffering now is that we seem to have a limited range of ways of thinking about and so therefore holding, framing, interpreting suffering. And borrowing from a bit of William Blake and his idea of single vision, twofold vision, threefold vision and fourfold vision, I wondered whether this path through how we experience suffering can make sense. Single vision, the state of Ulro, Eurozenic, narrow, approaches to suffering. I feel like they're captured in the tendency to turn suffering into a statistic. The idea that X percentage of people suffer from depression, say, or Y percentage of people at any one time feel anxiety, suicidality. There's a lot of these statistics around. They're used as measures of what's going on for people, what's going on in society. And there's value in that, of course, and to know the state of things. But, of course, the statistic, a brute number, is dead. It knows nothing of the felt experience of suffering. And so, therefore, can allure us into becoming detached from the suffering itself. We get very busy about the statistic. Would this schema work? Would that plan lower it? Set targets. It helps us dissociate from the experience of suffering itself. And people might use the statistic. They might begin a course of treatment to tackle their suffering and read some report that says that 50% of people get a good outcome, whatever that means. And it gives them hope, but maybe also leaves them a little passive in relation to what's really going on. And organisations... I think, can use statistics to try and deal with suffering very extensively. You might see it in the NHS. You might see it in a large corporation. Statistics enable such groups to set goals with good intent. They enable the organisation to feel it's noticing the suffering but it perhaps distances 
the organisation from the suffering again, a kind of collective dissociation, and puts to one side questions of whether the life of the organisation itself is contributing to the maintenance of the suffering, whether the society as a whole that is trying through political means, through civic means, to reduce the levels of suffering, is doing so in a way that means it doesn't have to ask questions of itself because the suffering is in the 20%, kind of over there. We care, but we're detached from it. William Blake would say that the measurement has taken the place of the experience and it's a defence against the fear that one might become part of that statistic oneself. Busyness can mount around the reduction of the statistic and better to be busy than to be vulnerable to the suffering that others are reportedly feeling. But it's not the only way. There is twofold vision. Now this is more alert to the experience of living itself. Generation is Blake's name. And in Generation, there is a place for suffering as part of the cycles of life. Where there's birth, there's also death. Where there's growth, there's also growing pains. Where there's emergence, there's also decline. And suffering here then takes on a different hue. It's held by rhythms and cycles. There's a time for laughter and a time for crying. There's a time for delight. And there's a time for sadness. And that's helpful. It tells us that things are constantly turning over. This too will pass. But it has a shadow side too. And that's the attempt to treat the person suffering like a biological entity, just part of these rhythms, even mechanical processes in life. And so help people to manage a way through suffering, which of course can be helpful, but maybe not to ask too much of the suffering itself. It's the tendency to self-anesthetise or self-medicate or regard life in such a way that the suffering is maybe an unfortunate part of it, but also a, an aberration from the happiness that we feel it should be. But twofold vision can give way to threefold vision, Blake reminds us, the state that he called Beulah. 
and in Beulah a different scent starts to appear because it's a soulful state of being and soulfulness has gentler feelings there's not so much the generation experience of survival, struggle, panic, resistance. But instead, the sometimes melancholic, at other times peaceful sense that the material ups and downs of existence are an expression of a deeper rhythm and pulse that's not a cycle unto itself, but is born of a wider current, a wider wellspring. And so the attention in Beulah can move from being focused on the immediacy of the suffering and the worry, anxiety that can hook into that, become entwined with that, and so compound the suffering, maybe, you know, many times making it worse, in fact. But finding the easefulness of Beulah and also the support of others, the connection, the awareness that something's understood, you're not on your own. This is not just part of the ups and downs of life, but is part of the human experience. And strangely, even in the suffering, connects us with others. Sometimes in spiritual traditions, you'll see writers make remarks like, I'm completing the work of life in my suffering. It's to enter more deeply into things. The suffering is still suffering, One's always wary of treating it romantically. But the sufferer might tell you themselves that they never knew of the significance and meaning of life more keenly than when they were suffering. They never valued it and longed for it more. And so this is why people who are suffering but are courageous or vulnerable can be so inspiring. They speak of soulful matters, not just the more mundane or temporal side of life. Something of depth comes through. It's the sick soul, William James remarked, that tells us that life is worth living, just not for the happiness that the happy soul knows spontaneously, but for the struggle that can put aside transient things and at least yearn and hope for subtler weightier more long lasting aspects of life and it's why Blake realised that threefold vision Beulah is the gateway to 
fourfold vision and the sense of eternity. And here one speaks even more cautiously because suffering is suffering. And yet, spiritual adepts will all tell us that there is a way out of suffering and that that way out is through suffering. It's why saints will say, suffering is sweet, not because they're masochistic, but because they realise it is a path that opens onto more. One can half rationalise this by perhaps saying that suffering teaches us hard lessons, like we're not in control of life. That the centre we thought we possessed is not the centre of all things. That life always was a gift. And whilst it's freely given, it must be held on to in that spirit of freedom and abundance, generosity. And then, as Blake says, we can kiss the joy as it flies. There is joy, but it is flying as well. It is moving. And when it's in this state of fourfold vision, we've realised that binding the joy to ourself or the attempt to possess it destroys that which is otherwise freely given. The way into eternity is sometimes through the darkness. This is the meaning, I think, of this phrase, the dark night of the soul, when everything that you thought you understood had were maintaining in balance, had cultivated, when you've realised that's not worked and you feel left in a void, in a desert of dark suffering, then maybe you realise that there's still a dark light, which is the life which was given is the source of that life which you only half feel, half sense is present. And yet, maybe reminded by the darkness is undeniable because you are still alive and holding on to that without trying to reach out and return to a former state, which is only going to let you down again, that dark light can begin to become established as the true presence, the true circumference, the true portal to the end of suffering, which the spiritual adepts promise. It's to realise that your life is a reflection, an echo, a dance, a fragment of life itself. It's to know that furnaces of affliction can become fountains of living water. It's to know that by letting go of life, that life is found. To know that in losing life, life is seen to never cease.
But these are hard reflections in a secular age. They're ones that are always difficult to offer, partly because suffering is suffering. And yet maybe they're ones that we can think again, can contemplate again in the labyrinth that is life the suffering twists and turns that seem to take us away from the centre but perhaps can be recognised as working for us taking us back to the place from whence we came Thank you.